Hello, this is Ben Leonard. I'm going to give a pre <coughs> presentation I uh, gave at the International Center at Purdue on December 7th, 2012. Um, I'm recording this on January 5th, 2013. So this will be the uh, extended uh, version, or you could say the director's cut of the presentation because I um, not on as limited of a time schedule I can talk about a few different uh, things or go into a little bit more depth than I was able to in the presentation. Also there were a couple of things that people asked me about in the presentation or after the presentation that I can uh, go into more depth on in this uh, presentation. So. Uh, this presentation, I <coughs> entitled it Five Things I Learned in Columbia um, because the theme this uh, semester or the past semester at the International Center Global Cafes was sort of a five uh, things topic. But I'd like to clarify this is five things I learned in Columbia. It's not the five uh, things I like most about Columbia or the five most interesting things about Columbia or um, uh, the five most surprising things about Columbia. So I visited Columbia during the past uh, summer. So this presentation is on uh, five things that I learned there and uh, or maybe I knew them a little bit ahead of time but they really uh, struck me during the trip. So it's not necessarily the things I like most about Columbia. It's not the things that may be interested in Columbia, although those would be interesting presentations to give as well. Okay, moving on. So in this presentation, I'm going to first go over uh, Columbia, cover uh, where it is, where and why. Then I will go over the five uh, things that I learned in Columbia. The first is the importance of geography. Second discuss, uh, point I will discuss is that life in Columbia is improving. Um, the third is sort of commonalities and differences that run through Columbian life and the Columbian people. So if you're wondering what is Columbian, this will give you a little bit of an idea. Um, the fourth are food and the traditions associated with it. Uh, when you, a lot in Colombia is fairly similar to the U.S., but in this aspect, there's some significant differences. And this, it, well, it's surprising how much this affects uh, life. And uh, fifth, the differences within the New World, so both the Spanish colonies and the English co English colonies or English and French colonies because England took over most of France's colonies are both the new world they were settled by Europeans so they have some uh, a lot the same but then there's some surprising differences that I didn't realize uh, um, before going so so first off where is Colombia? On the lower uh, picture here, you see I've got Colombia highlighted with a point. So it's in South America. It's the uh, northernmost country in South America. Uh, well, I guess maybe Venezuela gets a little bit further north. I'm not sure. It's just uh, <coughs> south of Panama. And then it's surrounded by Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Venezuela. So it used to be actually a country called Gran Colombia, which uh, was comprised of uh, both Colombia plus all of these other surrounding countries, and then they later uh, divided up. Um, so for this trip, I was uh, visiting uh, uh, three cities in Colombia. I saw Bogota, Medellin, and Cali. You can see the uh, locations marked uh, on the map to the right, and as you see, each of 
them is in the Andes or the mountainous region of Colombia. So my findings, I guess you'd say, are kind of for this region. The other regions of Colombia have uh, different uh, characteristics, I guess. So keep that in mind. During the trip, I stayed with uh, people I knew from Purdue or people who uh, are family members of people that I knew from Purdue. So I was uh, with friends the whole time and that really helped me uh, f find out more and made my trip more enjoyable. So uh, we'll go on to point number one, geography. <coughs> Uh, the way I've set up each point is on the first slide I'm going to kind of go over the thesis or my finding for the, what I think about this topic and then on the, I'll uh, we'll have a couple of slides where I will kind of go into a little bit more depth and show some photographs. Uh, nearly all of the pictures I took myself during this trip, of course the maps I didn't create myself and I, there's a couple uh, pictures in here that aren't mine, but for the most part, they're all pictures that I took. So, the area that I visited in Colombia, the Andes region, is mountainous, and this affects many areas of life. Some, just a few of the areas are the city size and density. Um, cities tend to become bigger and less dense, I think, if you aren't in a mountainous region. So, it's the Andes mountain. Uh, the ease of movement around uh, the region, the climate of the country, and where people live within the cities. All of this is affected uh, by the geography. Also, Colombia is located on the equator. That means that the temperature is going to be constant throughout the year. And because of this, your temperature is going to change with altitude, not with latitude, which if you're from uh, the United States or probably Europe, latitude is the key defining point for temperature. But here, and also the seasons are. But here the seasons and north and south in the country don't affect the, the temperature very much. <coughs> so first off, the mountains. I'm. Uh, one, th <coughs> the first point, city density. Okay, so in the Andes region, most of the cities are built in valleys or low-lying areas, or they're kind of up against the side of the mountains. So, for instance, Bogota is, I guess it's not in a valley. I haven't been to the other to the far side of it. Bogota, you can see in the lower right. Uh, but I guess it just kind of goes off in a long gradual decline uh, decline it doesn't have mountains right on the other side uh, from what the people have told me but the downtown is right next to the mountains so even there you can only go off on one side and <coughs> when I was looking out for Monserrati which is a mountain right next to the downtown it looked like on most of the sides there was mountains you could see mountains and uh, around the city and where you couldn't see mountains it was just that the city faded into the distance. So the difficulty of going outwards I think makes the cities much more dense. Another point is who is actually living on the side of the mountain. So if you have a flat, if you live in a flat or fairly flat region, at least a non mountainous region, it's more your location within the city in relation to the center of it, or I would guess there's some things like this. You want to be on the outside, you want to be inside, you want whatever. That affects where people live. But the, being on the side of the mountain was a key point here. And who lives on the side of the mountain? It turns out that uh, frequently it's the very rich and the very poor live on the side of the mountain. Uh, so if you're on a... Uh, the side of the mountain, uh, that means it's pretty hard to get up to this region. We went to a uh, barrio in Medellin, 
and it was so steep that uh, you couldn't drive the cars up there and you could only get up through stairs. Now in this particular place it was one of the more poor places and so the reason we visited it as opposed to one of the other poor barrios is that it has a electric escalator built up so the people didn't need to walk up and down all of those stairs themselves and uh, but so the poorer people will generally tend to live on the side of the mountains now on the other hand also the very rich people like to live on the side of the mountain too because there you'll see these big sky rise apartments and people will have these views out their windows looking out over the city and it seems like a lot of the cities were originally formed right by the side of the mountain so oftentimes the mountainside will be very close to the city center and the most important places of the city as well and then the middle class or the people that aren't very rich and very poor will tend to kind of live in the um, in the bottom of the valley although there's probably very rich areas uh, in there as well well, hopping back up to city density again, one thing I'd like to point out is on the upper right hand corner, uh, there you, we're at the, uh, on top of a mountain right beside Cali. And on this mountain there's a big uh, statue of uh, Christ being crucified. It's uh, the mountain, it's called uh, I believe Christ the Rey or Christ the King. So, if so, here I'm looking down the other side, and it's pretty much um, just wilderness countryside. Except you can see one pueblo or town that's not connected to uh, Cali. It's uh, just there. It's probably there's a road I'm sure going connecting it to Cali, but it's not a part of the city. Now, if I walk a uh, like 50 yards to the other top of this peak and I look down I will be looking right down on the uh, skyscrapers of Cali and I, I will be looking down at the cl closest to the, at the sort of downtown area it will be right underneath my feet so that shows you how the mountainside at one point you've got the big density and then you go up the mountain on the other side of the mountain it's well, I mean, it's as if you uh, weren't even close to a major city. Okay, now going down to point number three. You have a lot of great views on the mountains, from the mountainside. Every city I visited had uh, a few places where you could go up and you could watch, look out over the city. And these were places that a lot of people would go in. Bogota, the most famous place was Manserati. But uh, there were also uh, other places we drove up on some roads. There's some rich uh, um, barrios on the side of the mountain. There's uh, other places besides Manserate. In Cali, there's Cristo del Rey. Um, there's also uh, another place, I think it's called Tres uh, Cruces, or Three Crosses. It's on another mountain, although I think that area is a little bit more dangerous, so people don't go there as often. But, and then in Medellin, uh, there's Pueblito Paisa, which is on a mountain in the city, and you can look over it. There's also, as you see on the left picture on this slide, Medellin is surrounded by mountains. So, for instance, when we go to the airport, you're kind of coming down a mountainside, and you, you have a great view of the city. So there's lots of places where you can just look out. And you'll see lots of people that are at these locations just enjoying the view, having a nice time, relaxing. And this is something you can't find in any cities where I am. So, <coughs> Finally, uh, the difficulty of travel. Well, as when we were discussing the upper right corner of Cali, it's, even though this, the other side of the mountain is, uh, as the crow flies, very close to Cali, it's difficult to get there. So one of, since when I was reading on the internet, one of the things people said is they said, oh, well, you need to take a bus ride between the cities uh, of Cali, because then you see, or of Colombia, because then you see the countryside, and it's great. You're really not going to miss doing it. 
So I looked into doing this, and it seemed like I think the closest of the uh, rides was maybe like eight hours or so. But it was a one-hour flight between each of the three s cities that I visited. So even though these cities are just a hop away on an airplane, it takes forever to get between them because of the mountains because it's in such a mountainous region. And then uh, one of the uh, um, artifacts is, of this is that the places in uh, Colombia are uh, very different, even though they're very close together. So each of these three cities was close together but they had vastly different personalities. Um, even ethnically, the people were uh, a little bit different. At Purdue, I've met people from the University of uh, Choco, which is very close to Medellin. Now, Medellin has one of the, the people of Medellin have some of the lightest skin color of uh, all the people in Colombia. But then the people from Choco have uh, it looks like they're nearly entirely African uh, ethnically, uh, very dark. And so I assume they were kind of far away. But when I looked at the map in uh, of Colombia when I was on this trip, I realized, wow, these areas are right next to each other. So there's this big difference in the populations between groups who are really close to each other. I think partially because it's so hard to move it's so difficult to move around or it takes a while. So, okay, going on to the next point, temperature. Uh, in Colombia, as I mentioned, the temperature is um, dependent upon your altitude. It's not dependent upon latitude and it's not dependent on season. So, uh, because in Colombia, you can find any temperature you want. You can find snow, you can find really extremely hot uh, weather. Um, and it's all based on where in the country you go. So in Bogota, the temperature is around uh, s usually in the 60s all the time. So when I'm uh, as I'm giving this presentation, I'm just going to look at the temperatures here. So Bogota, temperature 68 degrees. This is probably a little bit high. It's usually more in the low 60s from my experience. Then in Medellin, Bogota is very high up. Then you go to, I didn't have problems there, but some people have problems with the altitude uh, in the city. Then you go to Medellin, which is sort of the next highest of the three cities. And it's typically in the 70s there. Call it the land of the eternal spring uh, because it's got such nice weather. It's usually pretty sunny, whereas Bogota is cloudy. And it's also in the 70s, so it's not too hot, not too cold. Now, as I'm looking at it, the temperature is 84, which is like is a scorcher for Medici. And then uh, Cali is further, it's lower. It's 86 degrees right now. It's typically in the 80s. And, uh, and okay, so also Colombia, as you remember from that first slide, is in the northern hemisphere because Ecuador is just south of it and the equator goes through Ecuador. So this is during the winter time, middle of the winter for Colombia. So, uh, and then from, I haven't been there, but from what I've heard, if you go to Cartagena or San Andrea or Barranquilla along the Caribbean coast, you'll find it's even hotter. For me, I, it seemed like Cali was not as bad as a bad summer in Indiana, or at least the time I was there, but it's pretty hot. It's, it, it's still pretty hot. Um, so one big aspect of uh, Col Columbia is the fruit and the flowers. Columbia is famous for both of them, and it's because with their weather, they can grow all sorts of different foods. So I know Indians are very proud of all of the 
vegetables or and fruits and different plants that grow in India and uh, they are rightfully so but one advantage at least I'm not an expert on India less of an expert on India than I am on I know less about India than I do about Colombia but one thing people from India have told me is that oftentimes some things they've got a hard time growing and they don't have very good like different berries for instance because a lot of plants you kind of need it to be colder for them to do well and so in India because it's really warm they really don't have those it's hard to grow berries and things like that but in Colombia grow all sorts of things because whatever climate you need you've got it it's, it's at some place within the country the other thing that I guess it makes sense but I <coughs> did not really realize that this took could even take place was that in Colombia all of the houses are unheated and that's because you don't need to heat them the temperature outside is fine so there's no point in heating your house because it's fine for it to be the same temperature as it is out inside the house as it is outside the house and uh, so that means that the indoor temperature varies with cities in Bogota I mean, you're not going to be, you generally wear long sleeves and long pants inside your house. Whereas in Cali, you wear short pants and short sleeves inside your house. Um, but, uh, you, you don't, you don't need heating. And I asked someone else, since I figured with some of the apartments in the sky, the in the sort of sky rise buildings. Maybe they have heaters there because you know you're way up in the uh, way up high, and you probably catch the wind more and things like that. And I asked some people, and they said no, you, they don't have them there. It's the temperature is still fine inside. So another thing is uh, skylights. So people have skylights in the United States, and. Typically, what is, if you see a skylight, you won't see them very frequently, but they'll be a part of, say, your living room, and they'll lend like natural light to it, and they make it look really nice, and it's kind of, I guess you would say, it's the center point of your room. You, uh, it's kind of the highlight of your house, and you have to pay through the nose for it because heat rises, and during the winter, all that heat goes right up next to that panel of glass and then right out into the right out into the atmosphere so uh, but here in the house I stayed in in Bogota you can see in my bedroom we've got some skylights just normal normal thing they make the room lighter so it was quite shocking to see that but when I thought about it it's like well why not have a skylight you know All right, now we'll move on to point number two. Columbia is improving. So, uh, Columbia does not have the riches or the, I mean, in terms of money or whatever of the United States, but it is improving rapidly. Now, you can, this is something that I'm sure a lot of people could uh, just, um, spend quite a bit long vacation or whatever and not in Colombia and they they wouldn't come home with this lesson and it's some, so it's something that you have to actually pay attention and look look around for to uh, see um, to uh, to see what's going on to uh, see this going on another thing that this uh, trip made me think about is what is more important is it your current, in terms of your standard of living, is it your current value or is your it your derivative? So for those of you who aren't uh, sort of the math types, if you have a function, you, you can have both the function's value. So say at x equals 1, the function's value is 2, or maybe another function's value is 1. So it's how much stuff you have now the other, second point is the derivative this is the rate of change 
of uh, of your uh, function? Is it so? It'll say, is it as you go from one point to the next, is your function getting larger or is it, or is it getting smaller? So think of the derivative. Is something improving or is it de uh, is it getting worse? So in terms of how you're living, would you rather have a lower standard of living but have it be getting better or have a higher standard of living but have it decrease? Which would you rather have? So just think some about this question because it's something that I've thought quite uh, about, uh, thought about uh, a lot since um, learning about Columbia in my uh, visit. So uh, to give uh, moving on, so the first point was just show, demonstrating that the uh, standard of living is improving. Uh, one thing is the increasing levels of traffic. Uh, one of the blogs I read, it's called Jim's Blog. It's, uh, uh, if you want to look for it, just go to blog.jim.com. And one, one of the things that he had talked about, as mentioned, is uh, sort of alternative ways to look at how wealthy a country is or how a country's economy is doing. Uh, because the standard ways can be manipulated. So one way that he suggested is looking at the number of cars in a country. And if the fleet of cars in a country is growing larger, it means that the standard of living is increasing because a car is a very useful tool to have, and it's something that uh, takes a significant amount of money for your average family. So you're not just going to get 50 cars or a hundred cars, I mean, you're limited in terms of the number that you can have. And also it takes space to store them, money to keep them up. So for the U.S., that the size of our car fleet has increased pretty much since cars were invented every year. And I think in 2009 and in 2010, the size of the car fleets got smaller or maybe it wasn't 2009 and 10, maybe it was 11 and 12. Uh, but recently it, we've had a, a getting smaller. And this shows that, you know, even though uh, uh, our uh, dear leaders are telling us that, yes, we're through the crash and we're doing so great, can't you just sort of admit it? And... Not, not always be whining about how the bad the economy is doing. Really, the economy isn't doing too well, no matter how much you fudge the numbers. Now, in Colombia, the person I talked to in Bogota was saying that during the four years that she was in uh, attending uh, university, the time of her commute doubled from something... Like I think like 20 minutes to 40 minutes and it wasn't that there's more uh, traffic or anything like that it was just that there are way more uh, cars the city was getting more and more congested as more and more people uh, um, were able to afford cars and bought cars and you can see that the traffic I put a couple of uh, pictures of the traffic in Colombia and so it's not just cars you've also got uh, motorcycles so nearly every young person can afford a motorcycle and they are more dangerous but uh, this means that private transportation is within the means of pretty much anyone in the country uh, now of course one person I a girl I talked to in Medellin, she was saying, well, you know, my parents don't allow me to ride on motorcycles because they're dangerous. And they certainly are dangerous. When you come to a stop, you know, all the cars will stop and order or whatever. And then all of the motorcycles come driving up between the cars and filtering up right up to the stoplight. So, yeah, it's a pretty risky a business driving a motorcycle. Back on to topics. So... The rate of traffic is increasing uh, quite a bit. Now, the 
when I was talking about this with a few Colombians, I said, well, I can see that, but there's a couple of things that you have to remember when you're uh, look, uh, looking at this. One is that uh, Colombia has um, really loosened up its free trade agreement. So now the price of cars has dropped uh, a lot. So it's a lot cheaper to buy a car than it uh, used to. I guess my response to this is two things. One is that when a country, say, goes the other direction and, um, say, becomes more communist or closes down its uh, market, then the standard of living decreases. And, okay, so all of the people didn't get just get stupid or anything, or all, all the engineers didn't just die. Or all of the uh, economy, all of the factories weren't just burned down. Everything is still there, but it's being much less productive because of the way it's employed. But that still ch changes the quality of life. And in terms of how well a country does, there's kind of two factors in it. It's one, like your capital, what you have, your natural resources, the education of your people. Um, your, how your families stay together or break apart. But there's also then utilizing those resources. So there's a lot of countries that are very poor but have tons of net resources and a lot of countries that are very ri rich but don't have many uh, resources. Say, take for instance, say like Singapore or Hong Kong. Very wealthy but no resources. Um, so I don't think that, I think that if the improvement came uh, along because of trade res changes in the laws, and that would also show an advance in how, in the level of that of Colombia's leaders and the wisdom, their wisdom, how well they're sort of leading the country. Um, a second thing is that uh, they said, well, and this will go into a little bit more. So to stop all of the congestion in Bogota, and I think they do this in other cities as well, I'm not sure. But what, one thing they do is they say, odd no at certain times of the day, only cars with odd numbered plates can drive, and on other days, times only even numbered plate plates can drive and at other times any type of car can drive but it's the times where everyone needs to drive that are that traffic is restricted so this sort of initially uh, cut down on uh, traffic but then all of the people who had one car they sold it and bought two or many, I guess, many of the people sold it and bought two cars that weren't quite as nice. So they say, well, you know, you can't really look at the level of traffic because, and with this, because a lot of people then they bought two cars. So in response to that, I guess, I thought is two things. Well, one, going from having one car to two car is a big increase in wealth, even if it does, even if it, goes along at the same time as having a reduction in the level of car. I know it was a big jump in the uh, U.S. standard, or I mean, it was one sign of the advancement in the U.S. standard of living when we went from families having one car to two cars. Now, uh, my understanding of the history, I haven't read a lot, is I think around after World War II, every family started sort of having a car, maybe even before that. And so you, the father would take it to drive to work, and then when he got home from work, the family could use it for doing different activities. But then after a certain point in time, then the families were able to afford having two cars. And this led to many changes in the U.S. society. One thing was when a family only has one car, when the wife then would go out shopping, she would go to a store that she could walk to. 
So there were a lot of smaller stores that you could walk to from the different, uh, from, from your house. Now that the, the wife and a family has a car, she can drive to go to the store and she can go to a much further away location if it's got a better price. So uh, that was one of the things that led to larger stores. Now, there wasn't Walmart, I think, right after this happened, but you had Kroger's, Kmart, and I believe those stores came around kind of as a result of this. You can have a big store where everything is together and you can have things cheaper because all of the families are able to afford to come there to one place on the outside of town where you can afford a lot of land to buy to buy their stuff. Anyways, I think that people, to uh, get back to topic, families starting to have two cars in Colombia is a, would be, I guess, make my point stronger. Also, uh, I don't know how many families can do that because the family I stayed with in Bogota, they had their, sort. this is very common, had a garage sort of inside their house. It looked like the house was originally built and then later after cars were maybe invented, they sort of put in the garage, and also you don't have a big yard, so you don't, can't build the yard and the, uh, the house in the garage, or I mean the garage and the yard, so it has to be inside the house. So I think a lot of people, you can't really afford to have two cars because there's no space for it. And most, the crime is higher in Colombia, so people don't park their cars outside really the way that people frequently do in the U.S., so I think a lot of people can't ac actually have two cars, even if they had the money to do it. Okay, so moving on to point number two. I saw a large number of young adults with braces. Now, of course, this is not going to be, not like 50% of the people or anything like that. But I saw it's a, fairly frequently I would see someone that was maybe around 20 years old, or early 20s with braces. Uh, being an American who is sort of intimately acquainted with braces, and I had braces for several years, um, I know that when you uh, get braces, uh, what you want to do is you want to buy them and uh, put them, have them on while your mouth is really growing a lot because then you can shape the mouth as it grows so that all the teeth come in correctly. Now, if you get braces after your mouth has mostly stopped growing, then frequently uh, you have to have teeth pulled out because, well, you don't, uh, there's no room to move the teeth around because the current st way of doing braces is you want to pull all your teeth sort of in if they're, they'll be pointing out, uh, sort of outward. And then you want to pull, sort of pull everything in and compact it. That's generally what you're doing with braces. That's why you've got this band around the out, out of your teeth. And then it gets tightened up each time to kind of pull those teeth in. So if you're all, your jaw is fully developed, there's too much, there's not enough space for the teeth there. And so your teeth get, you need to pull out some teeth to go in, to move them in. So that's a big reason why you, if there's any way possible, you get your teeth as a, in maybe the beginning of your teens or whatever, you get, you get them early in life. So when you see people in their 20s with braces, it means that they have access to orthodontic, uh, orthodontists, or those are the doctors that do braces now, whereas they didn't when they were, um, when they were children. Now this is probably for two reasons. One is people are more wealthy, so they can afford it. And second is there's probably more orthodontists. Now, when you increase the supply, of course, what happens? The price drops. So probably now then or, uh, braces are also cheaper. And as go back to the car, just because the braces are cheaper doesn't mean that you can't count the increase in braces as a sign of... Uh, um, as a sign of it, uh, people uh, becoming wealthy because the reason the braces are cheaper is because people are wealthy and can afford more braces to begin with. So this means that in this, so this 
so the cars, this change could have happened over a long period of time. It's really hard to say. But then with braces, this means that really the change has happened, has to have happened over the time that it takes someone to change from a teenager to a young adult. Because, I mean, you're not seeing people that are 50 years old with braces. I mean, maybe there are some, but that wasn't what I was noticing. So it means that people are seeing very large changes in their income or standard of living in the course of, say, of, say less than 10 years. And not, since I've kind uh, I'm on this topic. I'd like to uh, kind of delve into another thing that I'm not sure whether it fits here or not. But uh, so, even though this, so based on this thing about more people having braces, it means that most people couldn't afford to have uh, braces themselves. And when you look around at uh, people there, I mean, I'm not a dentist. I can't really identify the teeth too well. But you see that. Most people's teeth look pretty good. Um, to me, I mean, everyone's teeth look pretty good. So that means that people in general don't need braces. Uh, I've talked with my Spanish teacher. She said she didn't have braces. Her teeth look, uh, look uh, really good. And so then we come into the question of why don't people... Uh, why do Colombians need braces less than Americans? Because in America, lots, I think lots and lots of people have braces. Probably most people have braces. And from this, uh, that I'll go to a person called uh, Weston Price. He was an American dentist in the 1920s uh, and 30s. And he found out that uh, uh, sort of the way people's teeth are, both in terms of cavities and in terms of how well their teeth are aligned, whether they need braces, is due to health. And that is based on nutrition. So, I mean, I'm sure there's other factors, but nutrition is very key in this. So if, uh, and the reason why this happens is, as I mentioned earlier, the reason you need braces is because all of your teeth are kind of sticking out. And that's because there aren't, isn't enough space in your jaw to have, to sort of have all of your teeth uh, come in perfectly aligned. So they come in crooked because there's not enough space for them. So uh, when you don't have good enough nutrition, your jaws cannot grow to the right width as... Uh, as you would hope that they would. And that is why your teeth then become crooked and consequently why you need braces. So the fact that people in Colombia need f braces less than Americans, at least from my point of view, maybe, uh, may maybe other people disagree with this, is that they're eating a much better diet have much better nutrition, higher quality food. And that not only leads to uh, better uh, teeth, it also leads to a, I guess, a prettier face. So I read this interesting uh, article, I've, or journal article. Um, it was published a while ago, but in it, the dentist uh, does an experiment and he takes two twin sisters and based on I believe it was Weston Price or maybe some other uh, things he had got this he had found out you know having a wider jaw due to health is really uh, important for your teeth and will help with tooth alignment so these two twin sisters needed uh, braces they look in the study they show pictures of them before they look exactly the same. They're kind of average, average looking. They're not super pretty. They're not ugly or whatever. They're, I mean, they're typical girls. Okay. So they couldn't afford braces. So the dentist, what he said is, okay, so what we're going to do is we'll pay for one sister to have the standard braces. And then the other sister, we will give her our, uh, technique 
our new technique, which was a jaw expander. So it's going to push the jaws apart and then hopefully allow her to have room for all her teeth. And what is just stunning then is looking at the after uh, picture. So the girl that had the braces, she still looks like a typical girl. I mean, she, look, she looks the same as she did before pretty much. I mean, a little bit older. Uh, but the girl that had the jaw expander has become very pretty. And if I remember correctly, I will look up the uh, article and put it as a, in a link uh, below this. But she looks very pretty. And I guess, if I remember correctly, the reason they stopped the study was because it was just getting too distressing for that one twin sister who wasn't good looking to have her uh, to have her t other twin suddenly I guess be getting all the boys' attention and be looking so so mu so much better than her. So, anyways, uh, as we'll get to later in this presentation, uh, the Colombians are also uh, a lot. Of, the Colombian women have a reputation for looking. Uh, pretty, and maybe that's also kind of related to the high level of diet as well as the low number of Colombians which need braces. All right, so I'll move on to uh, this next slide. So on the previous slide, I discussed things that th that's what I observed while I was visiting Colombia, sort of walking around, looking on the streets. So I, when I came back, I looked, Google has a really uh, cool feature, uh, public data. So you just go to google.com slash public data and you can get all sorts of statistics on any country or sort of regions of countries and you can compare them and you can look at how they change over uh, different years, you know, so it's uh, feel free to just go over there and uh, play around for a while. You'll probably find it fascinating. So I went there and I looked through some of the statistics for Columbia and I grabbed uh, two out that I thought were pretty interesting. One is life expectancy. <coughs> so here I've on the screen you can see I plotted from 1960 to 2010 which I had the data for and you can see that it's steadily increased from about 58 years old to maybe 72, 73 or 4 years old. I mean, it's hard to say, but you can see, well, that that is a pretty big increase. Very Over the course of 50 years, life expectancy has increased uh, about 15 y years. So that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty good, I would say, you know. Uh, so generally as people get wealthier, can afford more things, can get better food, yada, yada, yada. Life expectancy, I think, correlate, well, it obviously correlates pretty well with standard of living. And I think in terms of uh, wealthiness, it also correlates pretty well. And then the next graph is a little bit more startling, and that's the GDP. So that GDP is gross domestic product. I believe the formula is something like government spending plus um, maybe uh, plus the private sector. I think I forget. Not, maybe it's like some of all the business that's done. Then I think you do uh, plus exports and minus imports. Some formula like that. I don't think that it's. A, I I have se severe disagreements. Uh, with the formula because, for instance, I think you should subtract gov government instead of add government, and I don't think that really imports should be subtracted. But anyways, it, it's commonly accepted as a good indication of the size of the economy. And when we look at Columbia here, you know, it's pretty low. And the bottom of the scale here is zero, and the top is $350 billion. And it's kind of growing some from 1960. We've got 1960 to 2011. And right around 2002 or 2003, you just see a big spike. And over the past decade, the 
GDP has decreased over three and a half times. So, I mean, that's hard to imagine. So you can also see a little uh, dip here during that rise. That's the crash in 2008. Now, of course, GDP, you have to take it with a grain of salt because governments like to fake their numbers to make them look good. So, for instance, if you believe the U.S. Uh, the US GDP numbers, uh, well, I've got some nice uh, oceanfront property in Kansas that I'll sell you for, for uh, give you a great deal on. You know, uh, but I think with these uh, numbers like this, okay, maybe it's not quite this large, but I, there you can see there's definite growth going over here. So both of these fact, these uh, observations kind of verify, or these statistics verify what I had seen on the ground in Colombia, and so I can say, you know, Colombia is really improving uh, a lot. Um, life, the standard of living is improving uh, very rapidly. So since I'm close to about 50 minutes right now, what I will do is I'm going to stop and then I will recommence for the last uh, three points. Uh, below this uh, video you should be able to see a link to uh, a place where I'm going to have the a copy of the presentation, the article I mentioned, maybe a couple other things, and also you'll be able to get a link to the next uh, presentation, next part of the presentation. So thank you for listening and I hope that you uh, join me again for part two.